Hello, it's Kyle talking about the geography of natural disasters in the U.S. In this video, I'll be discussing the spatial distribution of various hazards and how and why they affect people in different parts of the country. The vast majority of Americans live somewhere where they face at least one type of natural hazard. Many folks live somewhere where there are multiple types of hazards they have to worry about. Some happen more often, some happen very seldom, some are bigger, some are smaller, but pretty much everyone has to deal with at least one type of hazard. In a very broad sense, there are two different types of natural disasters, meteorological events and geological events. And generally speaking, meteorological events are more likely to occur in the east and geological events are more likely to occur in the west. And of course, you can have a tornado out west and you can have an earthquake back east, but for the most part, back east, the weather's gonna get you, out west, the earth's gonna get you. This is a subject that I'm very passionate about. I worked in the field of emergency management for several years. I have a degree in geography with a specialization in climatology. And after finishing school, I worked in hurricane preparedness, response, and recovery for the state of South Carolina for several years. And I then moved on to Monterey County, California, where I did all of the same work, but the hazards were earthquakes and wildfires and tsunamis. And I was on the ground for several response and recovery efforts for hurricanes and floods and ice storms. And thankfully, when I was in Monterey County, uh, there were no earthquakes or tsunamis to worry about. But you know, I got to work with federal agents, with FEMA, state and local governments, all kinds of first responder agencies. And it was a very rewarding job. And it's something I really do care a lot about. The first hazard I'll discuss are hurricanes. Of all the major natural disasters, hurricanes are the ones that occur with the most frequency. There have been 15 major hurricanes make landfall in the U.S. this century. That's almost one a year. And of course, some years are worse than others, with 04, 05, and 17 being especially bad hurricane seasons. If you hear about a typhoon hitting Japan or the Philippines, it's the exact same type of meteorological event as a hurricane. It's just in the Western Pacific, they're referred to as typhoons, whereas in the Western Hemisphere, they're referred to as hurricanes. Not all areas along the coast face the same hurricane vulnerability. And it's not just sea surface temperature that affects that vulnerability. When people think of hurricanes, they're probably going to think of Florida first, but Jacksonville, Florida hardly ever gets a hurricane making landfall there. And that's because of the shape of the coastline. When those Atlantic storms make their turn to the north, the prevailing westerly winds tend to keep the hurricanes offshore and it kind of creeps up the east coast. They often hit North Carolina because it's kind of sticking its butt out in the ocean, kind of taunting a storm to hit it. And you get a lot more storms hitting North Carolina than Jacksonville, even though the sea surface temperatures are not quite as warm there. But sea surface temperatures are exactly why you do not get hurricanes off the California coast, even as far south as San Diego. A lot of folks from back east are surprised when they first dip their toe into the Pacific Ocean off the California coast and you'll freeze their foot right off. It's not quite the same as the spa water you get in the Gulf of Mexico. So, you know, those currents coming down from Alaska are pretty cold and ensure that hurricanes are not going to be formed there. However, with global warming affecting sea surface temperatures, the water off the coast of California is gradually getting warmer. And it is possible that within, say, the next 50 years or so, San Diego could be hit with a hurricane. It was hit with a hurricane back in the 1850s, although it's an extremely rare occurrence. But again, with the temperatures warming, it might be something that San Diego has to think a little bit more about in the future. But San Diego isn't the only place that might have to start considering hurricanes as a potential hazard. New York is another place that might really have to start worrying about it. With the sea surface temperatures going up, it's very possible you could have a Category 2, maybe even a Category 3 hurricane making landfall in New Jersey or Long Island. And can you imagine trying to evacuate Manhattan from a hurricane? Do you think any of those high rises were meant to stand 150 mile an hour winds? I'm going to go ahead and say no, they were not. So that could be a that would be a major major issue. So you know, again, rising surface temperatures. I mean, hurricanes can extend farther out than they do right now. And of course, they're going to get stronger and more frequent in the parts of the country that already do get them. So Texas and the Gulf Coast and Florida up to the Carolinas can expect more frequent and stronger storms. And areas just outside of the hurricane type zones might have to think about you know, minor hurricanes making landfall there. Damage from hurricanes comes more from the water than the wind. Even though the winds are very high, it's going to toss a lot of things around. It's the water that's going to do the most damage. The areas right along the immediate parts of the coast are going to be hit with storm surge, which can do a tremendous amount of damage. And you get farther inland, you're going to be hit with a lot more rain and potential flooding. And it doesn't even have to be a hurricane for it to be devastating. Tropical Storm Allison in 2001 dumped so much rain on the Houston area, it just completely flooded it out, even though the winds weren't strong enough to even be classified as a hurricane. Something else that makes hurricanes so devastating is that with the exception of Hawaii, there's nowhere that a hurricane can hit where it won't affect millions of people. 
You could have a huge earthquake out west that occurs in the middle of nowhere and does virtually no damage, but with so many people living along the coastal areas in the east, a hurricane is guaranteed to affect tons of people. Okay, so now I want to talk about tornadoes. Whereas hurricanes are the largest storms on Earth, tornadoes are the strongest storms on Earth, with speeds over 200 miles an hour being very common and speeds up to 300 miles an hour being possible. They are incredibly destructive and pretty much any building in the way that hasn't been specifically engineered as a tornado shelter is likely to be destroyed. A couple of things to note about tornadoes is that most people know that the Central Great Plains is a part of the country that has the largest concentration of tornadoes, but a lot of folks don't know that Mississippi and Alabama are pretty much right there in terms of the number of tornadoes that hit, and they're often more destructive in the south because people in the south tend to not have enclosed basements that might help protect them from a tornado. Something else that may surprise you is that the United States is by far the number one spot in the world for tornadoes. It's not really a huge concern for other parts of the world, and sure, you can get a tornado in Eastern Europe or in Australia or other places, but the vast majority of the tornadoes on Earth and the vast majority of the really big ones occur right here in the U.S. The reason why you don't get many tornadoes in other parts of the world is that you think of Europe or Asia, the cold, dry air from the north is blocked by east-west oriented mountain ranges. You have the Alps in Europe and the Himalayas in Asia. So those mountain ranges keep the warm, moist air from the tropical regions segregated from the cold, dry air in the polar regions. In the U.S., our main mountain ranges are oriented north-south. The Rocky Mountains aren't going to do anything to stop the cold air from the polar regions from mixing with the warmer air from the tropical regions. I also want to address a couple of myths about tornadoes. One is that they don't hit cities. Tornadoes don't care if it's about to hit a city. It's just it doesn't happen as often because cities take up a much smaller area than rural areas. So, for example, Oklahoma City metro area and Tulsa metro area combined are less than 10% of the land area in Oklahoma, so it's just less likely to hit an urban area, but it certainly can. And Salt Lake City, of all places, was hit with a tornado that hit right downtown earlier this century, so it can certainly happen in a big city, but because they take up less space on the map, this doesn't happen as often. Another myth is that trailer parks are magnets for tornadoes. This certainly is not true. It's just that a tornado doesn't have to hit directly over a trailer park for it to be destroyed. It can be a quarter mile away, but the winds might still be well over 100 miles an hour, which would be enough to destroy a mobile home. Next up are floods, and it may be a surprise to you to learn that flooding is responsible for more damage than all of the other hazards and disasters combined. Flooding is by far the biggest concern in terms of natural hazards in the U.S., but why don't you hear about flooding as often as some of the other hazards? Well, it's because the media don't want to focus on flooding because it's just not exciting. You know, they want to focus on hurricanes and tornadoes and these big winds and you know, storms tearing buildings apart and earthquakes and things that are just destructive and fires and all this, you know, explosions and stuff that are, you know, human caused. But, you know, flooding is a boring hazard. It's just slowly rising water. It just doesn't make for sexy news. What makes flooding so devastating is that it destroys everything in its path. A hurricane can pass right over downtown Miami, but not every building is going to be destroyed. A tornado can rip right through a city, but a lot of houses will be destroyed. Some will be spared. An earthquake's not going to destroy every single building in the region, but a flood is going to destroy every single building. And it doesn't take much water to destroy your house. A couple of feet of water and your house is going to be totaled. And it's not like it's clean water either. This is very dirty water. It's full of trash and sewage and vermin and dead animals. This is very bad water and the long-term effects are really bad too with the growth of mold and fungus as a result. So it's really a double whammy with you know buildings being destroyed in the first place, but then it's really hard to calculate the long-term effects with you know health problems associated with all that mold and fungus. If you have flood insurance and the insurance company pays the claim, you're gonna be required to move as they're not gonna rebuild your house in a spot that was just flooded. But most folks do not have flood insurance and they may elect to stay in that spot where it's flooded. And that's where you're most likely to see the long-term health effects. Flooding can occur pretty much anywhere in the country. The big major floods are most likely to occur in the Midwestern areas where you have the large river systems and the flatter terrain. You also get a lot of flooding in the Appalachian region where you have some steep canyons just kind of funneling the, the water down. But anywhere where you have a creek or river, you can have flooding. So now let's talk about geological hazards. They occur less often, but the ceiling for damage is higher. The most common geological hazard are earthquakes, and again, they occur much less often than hurricanes, whereas there have been 15 major hurricanes make landfall in the U.S. this century. There have only been four major earthquakes in the same amount of time. The vast majority of geological hazards occur along tectonic plate boundaries. You've probably heard of the Pacific Ring of Fire, 
And this is kind of the boundary of the Pacific plate where it meets plates on either end of it. The last two major earthquakes to affect the contiguous U.S. were a 6.0 in Napa, California back in 2014 and a 6.8 that hit outside of Olympia, Washington in 2001, which affected the Seattle-Tacoma area. Earthquakes in this range are about the equivalent of a Category 3 hurricane, so they do plenty of damage, but they're not the hugely devastating ones. Which is why you'll hear geologists say that we are long overdue for a major earthquake, as there's been about 20 major hurricanes that have hit the U.S. since the last devastating earthquake in 94. But not everywhere in the West, or even in California, faces the same amount of earthquake vulnerability. For example, my mom has lived in California her entire life, and she's never been through a major earthquake. San Diego, California is to earthquakes as Jacksonville, Florida is to hurricanes. They can certainly happen there, but they happen with much less frequency. It's been a long time since San Diego has been through a major earthquake, and Portland, Oregon is in the same boat. It's been quite a long time since Portland has been through a big quake. But there are three places outside the western U.S. that have a large earthquake vulnerability. The New Madrid area of the boot heel of Missouri going down to Memphis, Tennessee has a very high earthquake vulnerability. In fact, the largest earthquake in U.S. recorded history outside of Alaska occurred in southeastern Missouri, so there's a pretty significant uh, earthquake risk right there. Another place that has a pretty high earthquake risk you might not think about is Charleston, South Carolina, and there was a huge earthquake there in the late 19th century. There are quite a few smaller ones that occur now and then, so they don't occur very often, and the magnitude isn't as large, but there is a pretty significant earthquake risk in Charleston. The third area outside of the traditional earthquake hazard zone that has a high earthquake vulnerability is central Oklahoma. Now, this has just occurred recently. Oklahoma didn't really have much of an earthquake risk at all until this century. And this is entirely due to the energy industry creating unstable land that's leading to some of these unnatural earthquakes. There was a 5.8 earthquake in central Oklahoma in 2016 that did some damage and it's a matter of when, not if, there'll be a six-point earthquake in Oklahoma City. A six-point earthquake in Oklahoma City will do a lot more damage than that six-point earthquake in Napa back in 2014. A hazard sometimes associated with very large earthquakes are tsunamis. They don't happen very often, and a very small percentage of the population lives somewhere where there's a tsunami risk, but they can occur. To get an idea of how a tsunami works, think about a bathtub and then tilting it to one side. When it tilts the other way, the water might overtop the banks. It's also not going to look like a giant wave that a surfer might be on. You'll often see these fake photos online or sometimes YouTube videos with these clickbait photos of these giant waves cresting over into the downtown of a city and they're calling that a tsunami, but that's not how it would look. A tsunami is going to look more like a giant storm surge as you'll get in a hurricane. So think about 10, maybe 20 feet of water, like a wall of water just rushing towards you at a high speed. That's what a tsunami is, not a giant wave overtopping buildings. But even along the west coast, there isn't a huge tsunami risk for most people. Back in 1964, there was a huge earthquake off the coast of Alaska that brought a tsunami down the west coast, but only a few very small parts of California and Washington and Oregon were affected by the tsunami. You know, most places along the coast, the, the elevation is so quick to rise, it didn't really affect those areas. But, you know, a significantly less likely situation, but potentially more dangerous, would be a huge earthquake occurring in the Caribbean or the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that could potentially bring a tsunami and do a lot of damage to Florida. I actually wrote the Tsunami Preparedness, Evacuation, and Response Plan for Monterey County, California. This was after the 2004 tsunami that affected primarily Indonesia. A lot of folks living along the coast in California were worried that this might potentially happen there, and there was some political pressure to put together a plan to make sure we were prepared, even though Monterey County really has a pretty small risk for a tsunami. And I got to put these things up all around town, all around the county, putting these things kind of like you have hurricane evacuation routes in the south. So that was kind of cool, but tsunamis are not very likely to happen, but they can be potentially dangerous if they do. And now for the granddaddy of all natural hazards. It puts all the rest of them to shame. Hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, earthquakes, tsunamis have absolutely nothing on volcanic eruptions. These are the hazards that have by far the highest damage ceiling and could potentially be responsible for the most devastation on a global scale. I'm a middle-aged man and I was a baby the last time there was a volcanic eruption in the contiguous U.S. Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980 and if you're old enough to remember that it was a big deal but Mount St. Helens was a very small eruption. It was an equivalent to about a category one hurricane or about a 5.0 earthquake so they can get a lot worse than Mount St. Helens in 1980. 
Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines erupted in 1991, and this was a huge volcanic eruption. There was so much ash and particulate matter sent into the atmosphere that it reduced global temperatures by one degree for about three years. That might not seem like very much, but one volcanic eruption single-handedly reduced global temperatures by one degree for three years. That's crazy. In the U.S., volcanoes are exclusive to the western part of the country, including Alaska and Hawaii, but if one were to erupt, it would affect the eastern parts of the country as well. In fact, if you're 100 miles upwind of a volcanic eruption, you'll be affected less than if you're 1,000 miles downwind of the eruption. Back in 2011, there was a volcanic eruption in Iceland, and it affected airports 1,000, 1,500 miles even east on continental Europe, so a volcanic eruption is going to affect areas that are pretty far from the eruption itself. You may have heard things online or seen a TV show about the super volcano in Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. And if this thing were to erupt, it'd be basically apocalyptic. You know, the world would come to an end kind of thing. And obviously, we don't want that to happen. You know, the odds are kind of like lottery odds. But, you know, someone does win the lottery each time. So it is possible, but it is very unlikely. And if it were to happen, there's nothing we could do about it. It's just pretty much over. You may be asking yourself, well, what about Hawaii? I've seen pictures and video of people standing right next to an erupting volcano. Or maybe you've been to Hawaii Volcanoes National Park and you've stood right there. Well, there are multiple different types of volcanoes in the U.S. There are three types of volcanoes. The ones you see in Hawaii we can get pretty close to are called shield volcanoes. And those are the least explosive of all eruptions. Cinder cones are the smallest of all volcanoes and don't have terribly explosive eruptions either. But the ones that we have to worry about the most, the ones that have the most explosive eruptions are the composite cones. And those are the ones you primarily see in the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. and Alaska that can do the most damage. Which is a nice segue into Alaska. And that's the place where you have the most geologic instability. And in fact, if Alaska were as densely populated as Japan or Indonesia, it'd be the biggest risk of anywhere on Earth in terms of you know, seismic hazards associated with volcanoes, earthquakes, and tsunamis. But from that respect, fortunately, there aren't that many people that live in Alaska, but the stuff they have going on there can be rather dangerous. So don't take too lightly the risk you face from natural hazards. The media never talk about natural hazards until they're happening right then. Right now, I guarantee you, somebody on the news is talking about terrorism, they're talking about bombing and all this kind of stuff. And those are big concerns, but there's nothing that any terrorist organization can do that can replicate a 7.5 earthquake in downtown Los Angeles or a Category 5 hurricane making landfall near Houston. That's just a significantly greater concern, but again, it's just not as sexy as talking about explosions and things going on that are human caused. So kind of like within the hazard field, you know, they like to talk about the hurricanes and earthquakes, but because flooding isn't as exciting, it gets less press. So don't, you know, undermine the effects of hazards. Don't think that, you know, your risk is not as much because you're not talking about it. Mitigation and preparedness are very important. So just make sure you're prepared for whatever hazard might potentially face you and wherever you live. I hope you found the information in this video useful. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve. And if you're interested in stuff like this, some nerdy geography stuff, you're interested in road tripping across the U.S. or just some general U.S. travel stuff, subscribe to my channel. Those are the things I'm posting. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King signing out and about to go see if that shaking I just felt is our house sliding off this ridge.